here and join us tonight for the final in our spring time in memorial speaker series. Um, and Michael and I are working hard to emphasize that this is our spring series. It's been so popular and we've had such a warm welcome from folks across the province that he and I are um, going to come together and work again to do something in the fall and throughout the winter to continue on our learning journey together. And so tonight I'm super, super honored to have a dear friend Kelly Brownbill here with us who's going to share um, some thoughts with us tonight and help us think a little bit more about our work um, as allies and in allyship. Um, and we're also super honored to have Ann Taylor with us. And Ann, um, you just wanted to say a huge miigwech to you for guiding Michael and I on this journey together and helping us plan and really think about the series and how to bring this together in a good way. Um, and so I think I'll invite uh, you to start with an opening prayer, um, and then I'll follow with a land acknowledgement after. Okay. Miigwech, Holly. Um, miigwech, Michael. I, I am so glad to be a part of, it, of of what you two do. You do a, such amazing work, and uh, it's always uh, my pleasure to help with that. So I'm, I'm going to light my smudge stick, and I'm going to... Uh, going to say a prayer and uh, then I'm going to turn my camera off and my, my speaker off but I'll be paying attention. So I'm going to introduce myself to um, before the prayer. So we went in Bojo Hanin, Mankwan Dishnikaz, Nikig Genin Dodan, Chikigamon Genin Donjaba, Nichisagi Ganishina Bakwendo. Shweminido, Shkakamikwe, Nokamis, Shomis, Wabanung, Shaunung, Ninkabianung, Kiwed Nung, Ishkdina Wagananun, Miigwatch Gaminig Nungum Gishgad, Gam Miigwatch Gaminig Nungum Gisus for bringing us light and warmth, Gagachi Miigwatch Gaminig Mbe, for that is our life source. Miigwatch Gaminig Gon Gagamuan for bringing us fresh clean Nbe, Gan Odin. For bringing us fresh, clean air. Gagachimigwach gamin yeg ake, for she sustains us. Miigwach kenago nungo sag spimming ayo, gadabit gizus that watches over us. Gagachimigwach gamin yeg guchisin that we stand on, that we call shomus, for that is our foundation. Miigwach kenago esiag, gigo sag, nido se sag, neshi sag, ntigog, ge kenago mashkiki gamin yeg. Miigwech for those that have been before us and have left these gifts for us to share and carry forward. And miigwech for those yet to come for giving us this responsibility. A prayer of healing today for this earth, for the land, for the waters, for the air, for our people, for our languages. A prayer of love and respect, enlightenment, acceptance, peace, and hope. A prayer for those of us that need you to walk with us this day to guide our steps to allow us to feel your presence in our lives and to remind us we walk this path together. A prayer for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan who are going through a particularly difficult time this day. A prayer for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine and in Russia who are going through a difficult time this day. A prayer for all of those people in the world that are going through such difficulties that they have no control over May they find peace, and may they find hope, and may they find kindness. A prayer for those little voices that continue to be heard in our own land, those ones that were silenced for so long but are now coming to light, and their stories are finally being heard and finally being listened to. May they find peace, may they, their families find peace, may their communities find peace. Ashwen Mishnan Kishwimanido, Ashwen Mishnan Kishwimanido, Ashwen Mishnan Kishwimanido, Ashwen Mishnan Kishwimanido, Miigwech, 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 Mikanaguna. Oh, Miigwech for allowing me to share that prayer with you. It's a prayer of thanksgiving that I try and use every day because it centers me and it reminds me of the work that needs to be done and it reminds me of my place. 
It reminds me of those ones that have yet to be born and the reason we do all this work that we're doing today and this evening. So um, enjoy tonight's presentation and I thank you once again for allowing me to be a part of it. And uh, I'll just, I'm gonna turn off my screen and my, uh, my speaker now, um, but miigwech, I'm looking forward to tonight. Miigwech. Miigwech and so much. We're so glad you could be here with us. Um, and so tonight, I, um, I'm coming to you from my little place on this beautiful earth. Um, it is a settler community today known as Kearney. Um, I am on unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin territory just to the east of me, um, just to the north of me is Huron, Robinson Huron Treaty territory, and just to the south is Williams Treaty. And where I live, all of these overlap. Um, I live on the water and I have uh, such an honor to have so much access to the beautiful land that surrounds me. Um, it is a place where I walk each day where my ancestors have been guests here and walk for seven generations in the same place. And I think each day as I reflect on um, not only the work that I do in my professional life, but certainly what I hope to guide myself as an individual and really think so deeply about the conversation we're having tonight about what does it mean to be an allyship. I'm reminded each day of my roles and responsibilities to care for this place in the way that we have been taught and has been so generously shared with my family for so many generations. Um, and so I ask us to keep that in our minds and our hearts tonight as we welcome Kelly to share with us this evening. We're so, so honored to have you, Kelly, to wrap us up in our lovely speaker series, and I'll turn it to you. Miigwech, my friend. Welcome. Wow. Chimi Gwet Chali, Wawena Bojo, Wabananga Kikwe and Dishnakas Wab Jushi Dodem, Migma Anishnabe Kwe and Dao Dome, Guk Don Jaba Fading the Dekwe and Dao. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, when I heard of the other speakers that you've had during this series, I was quite intimidated and wasn't sure exactly what I had to offer, but I will do my very best. Uh, before I start, uh, please allow me to take a minute and just say a heartfelt uh, chimi guetch to Anne for that beautiful prayer. Um, I hear opening prayers all the time, but um, the way that you presented that prayer of thanksgiving and, and um, the, ask, the, the gratitude and the asking for um, the blessings that we have to be shared with other people in that way really touched my my soul and my spirit so I, I just wanted to take a minute and thank you so much for that it was I found it very very moving tonight as Holly said I am going to talk with you about the link between allyship and land acknowledgements under that heading of time immemorial I've been thinking about allyship pretty specifically for about the past four years, I think. Um, I've been doing cultural competency work for 25 years now, and I've created a number of different workshops. But allyship was a new frontier for me, and I spent pretty much a calendar year staring at my belly button thinking about what really is allyship? What does what does it mean? And um, when do I know it when I see it? And, and when am I not so sure it's what I'm seeing? And I ended up um, writing a full day's workshop on allyship just before COVID hit. So not only did I had to sort of roll out a new workshop, then I had to figure out a way to roll it out in a virtual setting. So it was a real pleasure for me to take that, those thoughts that I had had, revisit them through um, the thought of time immemorial. So I hope that I will be able to share something meaningful with you tonight. This is me organizing my thoughts on, on these things. And I think I'll go through it all in one piece and then we'll have questions at the end. Is that all right, Holly? That's perfect, Kelly, thank you. Okay. So let's just think about what these two things are. Allyship to me is supporting a group or a community that you yourself are not a part of. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the true essence of reconciliation whether it's reconciliation as we think of it here in Canada today uh, with Indigenous people, 
or whether it's reconciliation in any other way or in any other relationship, we could use reconciliation to talk about the issues with Black Americans south of the border, for example. So to me, allyship is that true essence. It's when you can remove yourself from the picture and truly be selfless in helping someone else because you recognize that uh, that's a necessary part of creating a better society. So it's the essence of reconciliation to me. Land acknowledgements are really, to me, a way to finally tell the truth. That's what I think the purpose of a land acknowledgement is. And truth is the very first step in reconciliation. I say that over and over and over again, that, you know, we had a truth and reconciliation commission and we cannot lose sight of the truth. And if land acknowledgements are a way to tell the truth, but what better way to move into allyship is through the marriage of those two things. That's um, what really occurred to me as I sat down to think about this. So I'm going to talk first about allyship, and then we'll swing back to tying it into that understanding of land acknowledgements and how um, we can be present, I guess, in the work of allyships while acknowledging the history and telling the truth about how we all got here. So who needs allies? Why is it even important that we have this? Well, first of all, I think that reconciliation cannot happen in isolation. It's not something that Indigenous people are going to do in their home communities, not something they're going to do um, on their own. This is um, work that has to be done from both sides of the shore. This is a bridge that gets built from both sides of the shore. It's also important to recognize that Indigenous people were not necessarily the problem. And I don't think allyship is about pointing fingers or placing blame, but we need to look at what happened to us and, and who was the architect of that process. And so it can't just be us fixing this because we were not the architects of what brought us into the mess that we are inheriting today. And I think this expression, we are all treaty people, gets said over and over and over again. And it said so much that I think we actually forget to hear it. You know how sometimes you hear a phrase so often that it just sort of bounces off your consciousness and you don't really unpack it? I think we need to unpack we are all treaty people. What does that actually mean? Treaties are contracts. And contracts always have to be between two parties. They can't be a con. You can't have a contract with just one party. It always needs two parties, a buyer and a seller, for example, right? And so we talk in Canada about Indigenous people in treaties and how we are treaties. And that's right. We are one side of the contract. But the other side of the contract is Canada. So if you live here, if you work here, if you pay taxes here, if you vote here, you are Canada. You are everybody as much a treaty person as an Indigenous person is. They're your treaties, just like they're my treaties. And so it's really important when we start these conversations, both about land acknowledgements and about allyship, to recognize this is our story. This is our process. It's not about them or us. We need allies because there are rooms that we don't enter. There are conversations where we're not heard. And you have access to audiences that we don't, whether it's coworkers, friends, colleagues, whether it's family members, they are walking around ill-informed. They are walking around with um, uncompleted thoughts on these issues because no one's ever given them the proper education. I don't have access to them, but you do. And so you can advance the ball down the field even farther than I can get it. I also truly believe that more damage is done by the ill-equipped or the ill-informed. And so if we just sort of blindly go baffing around out there, uh, we can cause more harm than good, even if our intent is pure, even if we're trying to be part of a solution. If we don't know what we're doing, we're apt to make further mistakes. One of the um, examples I, I use quite often is when people say, oh, I, you know, I, I understand what our history is. I understand that Indigenous people have been surviving here for thousands of years before Europeans showed up. And they think they're all woke and stuff, right? But you can't use the word survive. That's um, a holdout from the doctrine of discovery that said there was nothing here of any value before Europeans showed up, that my ancestors were running around helter-skelter, usually naked, just waiting for someone to cross an ocean and save them. 
you can't survive for 20,000 years just hoping someone's going to show up and save you. You can't hang by your fingernails hoping that someday someone's going to come and show you the right way to do it. So that's what I mean by the ill-equipped or the ill-informed is we need to unpack these things and really think about them and say the Indigenous people thrived here, didn't survive here, which continues to minimize our presence. Um, and that's certainly something when we start thinking about creating our own land acknowledgements is looking at the power of that language and is the language that we're using really uplifting or is it continuing to, um, you know, uh, uphold uh, colonial thoughts and processes. I think it's important to understand that you have to earn the right to call yourself an ally. It cannot be self-appointed. It astounds me that people think they can say, I'm an ally. I'm a cis um, gendered straight woman. I don't say I'm an ally to the LGBTQ community. They get to decide whether or not my actions warrant allyship, just like they get to decide if my actions are offensive to them or not. So it's not something that you can claim the community that you're trying to support looks at your actions, looks at your intentions, looks at the outcomes and says, yes, this is someone who is an ally. So understand that in this process, you just can't adopt, say, yep, I'm going to be an ally today. You can say, I'm really working towards being an ally. I hope that my actions uh, demonstrate allyship, but you can't be self-appointed, just like we can't be a self-appointed elder. You also need to understand, I believe, that your silence is complicit. Now, people I respect very, very much have challenged me on this and said, you know, there are some arguments we just aren't going to win, right? Drunk Uncle Fred at Thanksgiving dinner, you're never going to convince him. He's going to hold forth with his racist attitudes because he wants to make a fuss. He wants people to start sniping at him, right? That's what he's trying to do is stir the pot, as my father used to tell me. You're never going to win that one. That's not the hill that you should die on. I'm not saying you have to enter every battle. But when you don't expect a land acknowledgement at the beginning of an important gathering when uh, you don't talk about why these things are important. You are complicit in allowing those colonial tendencies, those colonial attitudes to continue to invade what we what is Canadian society today and we have an opportunity right now to make it better in the workshops that I do I say all the time we are not responsible for what happened before we showed up but you know what we're here sure we've been left a mess by the generations that came before us but we we could belly ache about that we could be sad about that or we could roll up our sleeves and say what can we do not because it's our fault but because we are perfectly positioned to make a difference and leave something better for those who are coming after us. So that's why we need allies. That's why I think we have to have these conversations about allyship. So what is an ally? To me, an ally is someone who has a true desire to help. Their um, motivations are not based on, on promoting themselves or on, you know, ticking a, a box on a list, but a true desire to recognize a community that isn't experiencing the same privileges that you are and that you have an opportunity to use your power and privilege to address that. An ally to me is someone who is comfortable enough to place themselves second. You are sacred. You are not more sacred or less sacred than anyone else. And your way of being, your way of knowing is sacred. But if you see somebody struggling, an ally isn't someone that comes over and says, here's how I do it. This is how you can fix yourself. An ally is someone who goes over and says, I know how I like things to be done, but I'm okay right now. So I'm comfortable in parking that over here. What do you need from me? What do you need to be able to make it out of that struggle? So an ally is someone who doesn't have to always keep score or compare and think, am I getting what I want out of this? You have to be strong enough to say, you know what, I'm okay right now. So I'm going to meet them where they need me to be to meet them. I think an ally is someone who is dedicated to new paradigms. You've got to be able to let go of the old. You've got to be able to say, you know what, there are better ways to do this. Um, I, I, I always laugh at people who are parents who always talk about, I'm not doing things the same way my parents did. I'll never do that to my child. 
usually they end up repeating those same behaviors. So, so what we need to do is actually find the strength to say, no, I'm going to do something different. I talk a lot about my father um, and how he raised me. And I, I talk about how he was the strongest man I ever met because he was raised with specific attitudes and he held them very near and dear. He never gave up those attitudes, but he was strong enough to know that they didn't serve his children well. And he actually taught his children something different than he was taught. A quick example, my husband or my, my father actually grew up with very Victorian parents and was taught very different male female paradigm where, um, you know, the, the male is the breadwinner and does all the hard work and the woman should, you know, be taken care of and should stay at home and raise the kids truly believed that that's how life should unfold and yet he recognized that would not serve me well at all so he raised me to be whatever I wanted to be I wasn't told to be a secretary I was told to be a lawyer I wasn't told to be a nurse I was told to be a doctor he didn't give up his attitudes he just was willing to say there's a better way to do this than I was taught I'm not going to change but I'm not going to perpetuate those um, attitudes and perspectives that can be updated. He was dedicated to creating new paradigms in his children, in his family, and in his community. What an ally isn't is, whoops, is someone who is performative. There's a lovely video I show when I do this whole workshop. It's a very, a bunch of young people talking about performative allyship. Um, and they are predominantly uh, young people who are representing uh, the queer community. And they talk about, you know, you can post love is love on your Facebook page, but if you're not there when challenges are happening, if you're not writing letters, if you're not making phone calls, if you're not standing in line when we need to be counted, then what good are you? It's not a punchline. Allyship is not a punchline. It ha cannot be performative. You have to be able to say that you are making a difference. There's a, a, a lovely young person in that video who talked about uh, friends of theirs that wanted to go to Pride and, and, and be in the parade and do all these things and called themselves allies. And yet when he was hurting because of the horrible crimes committed against the queer community in the United States, and he's in this video, they say, I was struggling to breathe. None of his friends called. So that's what performatism is. It's when, um, you know, you're just dancing across the surface and you're not making real wholesome changes. An ally isn't false. An ally isn't someone who stands up and calls themselves an ally in order to further their own agenda. Uh, my, my daughter ran into this when she was in student unions and university, when she's getting into student politics. And she was in a, a stu um, Indigenous Studies student union. And one of the members there who, even though they had a very circular uh, organizational structure, certainly elevated themselves to be in a leadership position and, um, you know, talked about being an ally. This was a non-Indigenous person who was always the first one at the microphone, always the first one talking about these issues. And yet when it came down to making differences for Indigenous students on campus, he was nowhere to be found. He had a plan. He wanted to be um, you know, part of a bigger student union and part of a bigger uh, uh, future for him. And this was a stepping stone. This was, um, you know, a line in his resume. And that's a false ally. Uh, my daughter actually went to the to the the end point of actually posting across her social media contacts. Just because you see me standing beside someone doesn't mean I recognize them as an ally. Sometimes in order to do the best work I could do, I need to put up in these situations. I need to stand beside these people so I can do, do something different, so I can make a difference. But it does not mean I recognize them as allyship or as, as being an ally. So um, perform a, a false ally doesn't help us at all either. An ally isn't someone who uh, just thinks, you know, I'm such a good person that I, of course, I must be an ally. They are so righteous in their own being. I have a, a, a long story about uh, righteous allies that I've run into in the course of my uh, life. And it's someone who tells me, you know, how dare you be offended by what I'm doing? Can't you see I'm honoring your people? Can't you see how much I'm honoring you people? That's someone who is so convinced that they know exactly what's right or wrong and good or bad. And they hold themselves to be a, such wonderful people. They don't listen. They don't listen to my perspective. They don't listen to any other perspective. They just think they've got it right all the time. Makes, makes me crazy. Um, the righteous ally. So you can't be putting yourself at the beginning of this story. 
Same with a celebrity. Celebrity allyship is something that um, I struggle with a lot. Um, and I, 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 I get the odd, you know, twitch every now and again, because we see celebrities who are doing something good. And I don't distract from the fact or detract from the fact that they are creating some good, but their name gets to be front and center. Their name is on all of the new buildings or whatever that are being created, um, as opposed to being in the background, actually changing uh, the way the rest of society views Indigenous people. So I, I don't mean to offend anybody. People usually get upset by my examples of, of a celebrity ally, but I'm going to jump into the deep end anyway and hope you won't um, you won't be too angry with me that you won't continue to listen. But to me, a celebrity ally is someone like Gord Downey, um, who, you know, did an amazing piece of work with the, the Wenjack family and told an amazing story with haunting, haunting lyrics to his songs. But that is not allyship. That's um, a, a different process altogether because he's telling one story and he's doing it um, through his perspective and through his art. And all of the funding now is all talked about the Downey Wenjack project, right? His name comes first versus um, a group at the Junos a few years ago uh, when a young Indigenous artist, Jeremy Dutcher, received an award, wanted to stand up and talk about how Indigenous people are treated in the music industry in Canada, and they wouldn't let him speak. They played him off the stage. A little bit later, a group called the Arkells won their own Juno, and when they had their time at the microphone, they said, sorry, we have nothing to say. We want Jeremy to come back because he has important things to tell you. They made room for an Indigenous voice as opposed to imposing their voice on an Indigenous issue. So I please don't think I, I, I speak badly of Gord Downey. He's done amazing work and so much money has been raised and good things have been done. I'm just not sure I would hold him up as the shining part of allyship. He's a number of other really good things, but I'm just trying to really split some hairs on allyship. To me, the Arkells making room for Indigenous voices is more of an ally than um, working with Indigenous people and, and uh, you know, having a Downey Winjack um, fund. I hope that hasn't offended any of you. You can yell at me when I'm done and it's question time um, if you're mad at me for uh, casting aspersions on Gord Downey. The savior is not the ally either. The someone that comes in and says, you know what, I know what you need. Just listen to me and I'll tell you exactly what you can do to get yourself out of this horrible predicament you're in. We don't need saviors. We are quite capable of saving ourselves. Um, this is uh, dances with wolves. This is Avatar. This is always somebody from, um, you know, the the non-Indigenous community that's coming in and so selfishly gives them themselves to lead us to safety or to lead us to freedom. I'm tired of saviors. So there's just some conversation on to me what an ally is and what an ally isn't. So we can, again, wrap our head around that concept. Advocacy and allyship quite often get um, mixed up. And so I think it's important that we talk about what those two things are. And again, my opinion on what these two things are based on, you know, a year of navel gazing. To me, advocacy is when you use your power or privilege to support another who doesn't have that power or privilege. And the example that made the most sense to me that I've been sharing is um, a doctor who will call an insurance agency to make sure that the benefits are put in place. When I was pregnant with my daughter, I got very sick, but the way that my doctor filled out the form saying I had to be off work, the insurance agent said, well, no, she can work. I'm not going to pay her benefits. But my if I had called the insurance adjuster, they would have said, no, no, this is, you know, this is what our policy is. You don't get benefits. When my doctor picked up the phone and called the insurance person, they listened because the doctor had the power and um, the uh, position to be able to say, I'm telling you, this is a medical need. She must be off work and it'll be on your head if we send her back to work because she can't afford to work without any income and can't afford it if you don't give her benefits and something happens to her or her unborn child, you're the one that's going to be liable for that. They would never have heard me if I said that. So that was my doctor being an advocate for me, using their power and privilege in a place that's recognized to hear the truth. An ally 
is when you use your power and privilege to make room for other voices to be heard. So let's say my doctor was invited to speak about Indigenous health issues at a major international conference. And they say, sure. But when they show up, they don't speak. They bring Indigenous people with them to talk about their own issues. They, the doctor had the power and the privilege to be invited to that conference in the first place. And then they use that to make room for the Indigenous voices. That was what the Arkells did, right? In making room for Jeremy Dutcher. And maybe, I don't know um, if Gord, maybe Gord Downey did this too, but as well as doing the Cheney Wenjack project, maybe if he'd stayed around um, longer and we'd been blessed with his um, presence longer, he could have said, the next time I cut a record to whoever wants to produce my record, you also have to produce free of charge at least three struggling Indigenous artists. So he made room for their voices to come through. I hope that's making sense to you. It's hard without us conversing back and forth, but I hope those examples ring true for you. Both of those things are necessary. We need advocates. There are times when no one is going to listen to me because I'm not the doctor or I'm not the expert. And so my indigeneity comes second to that. But there are many times that we are letting slip through our fingers where room for Indigenous voices could be made. And we need both. We need advocates and we need allyships. The problem is advocacy is always, or allyship is always going to be harder. Sorry, that's a misprint. It says advocacy. It's supposed to say allyship. That's what happens when you put your slides together 15 minutes before you start. Advocacy is easier because you're swimming in your own pond. Allyship is when you say, I'm okay here, but I'm gonna try and make room for someone from that other pond. It is hard, hard work because you need to be strong enough to say, I'm okay. Um, everything that I've worked for, nothing's gonna get taken away. I'm not gonna become less than if I support somebody else in the way that they need to be supported. So allyship is really quite the contradiction. You're doing something for a group that you are not a part of, and yet it requires you to be incredibly self-aware of your own um, actions, your own uh, perspectives, your own biases, in order to be able to do that work. The very first ingredient to me in allyship is being self-aware. What is it that you bring into this conversation? Why is it that you want to enter into this relationship of allyship? Self-examination, self-awareness, one of the hardest things that we can ask of you to look inside. It amazes me how many people I run into in our society on a daily basis that never really turn the mirror inward and have honest and frank discussions with themselves about where they are. Um, a dear, dear, dear man uh, who was a mentor to me for about one day, about 25 years ago. I have never forgotten him. His name is um, Dick O'Brien. He was a therapist and he was talking about being self-aware and he was saying he had a, a client who was on his fifth divorce and he was sitting in Dick's office talking about this and saying, here I am again, divorced again. I don't know, doc, do you think it could be me? And Dick said to him, I don't know, but why don't we, why don't we examine that for a little bit? It took him five divorces to start to think about what was I bringing into those relationships. Now that might be a little bit of an extreme, but it amazes me how many people really don't shine that spotlight on themselves. But I think that it is inherently important to allyship. No one is authorized to judge you. That's a foundational premise in Indigenous ways of knowing that understanding of non-interference. Nobody is allowed to tell you what to do. No one is allowed to judge you. But with that gift comes the responsibility of you having to do it yourself. You having to look inward and be aware. So on that path to allyship, it will require, even though it's about helping others, I really believe it will require you looking at you, looking at your upbringing like I did with my dad and understanding the way that, you know, I, I didn't get to that understanding when I was 14. I didn't even get to that understanding about my father that I shared with you until after he had passed because I lost him very, very young in life. Um, the other thing he used to say to me was coming from his perspective, he was born in the 1920s. He was a veteran of World War II. He spent six years in World War II. And he would say to me, Kelly, treat everybody the same. He wanted 
um, me to understand that I shouldn't judge people based on their age or the color of their skin or what they wear on their head or how they pronounce words, uh, you know, in a, in a foreign language to them. I was not supposed to consider that, those things. I was just supposed to consider people to be people, to be friends. Anybody who walks in our door is a friend until they prove otherwise. But I had to get to the point where I was comfortable enough to say, that's not enough, Dad. I don't know what's beeping. I hope that's not me. Uh, I hope that's something in the background. I'm not bothering you, but um, nope, I'm here. Something so. in the background. It might just be a cat walking on a screen or something. Okay. <laughs> There's no cat here. I left him at home. So I, in, in, in examining my upbringing, I needed to get to a place where I said, dad was right in what he was teaching me, but he didn't quite get there. Because when we treat everybody the same, we're going to create inequity. Um, you know, the, uh, we hear the golden rule all the time that treat everyone the same way you would want to be treated. But I don't know that you want to be treated the same way as I do. So I would prefer that we treat everybody the way they want to be treated. So that's one of the things you need to be comfortable with is looking at what were you taught and does it maybe need to be updated a little bit? Because, you know, love my father to distraction. Again, have never met a man even close to as strong as he is. And yet I also had to say, but he didn't quite get there. He used the language that was appropriate to him that he had at his uh, um, fingertips, but it's my job now to take it and go, no, I'm not going to treat everyone the same. I'm going to treat everybody the way they want to be treated because they may not all want to be treated the same way as I am. So you're going to need to look at your upbringing. You're going to need to look at your belief system. Um, you know, what is embedded into your faith community or your spiritual community that maybe isn't conducive to allyship. Um, we know that this is part of the story of colonization. So not talking about today, but when we talk about contact, you know, those first European missionaries and, and evangelists were coming over because they firmly believed theirs was the only path to heaven. They firmly believed that. And so they were not prepared to be allies because everybody else would have been doing it wrong. They were very benevolent. They wanted to save our immortal souls at the beginning of the story at any rate, certainly not later on, but they were wanting to save our immortal souls. But they needed to be able to go past that belief system and say, you know what, it's okay if somebody else has a different system, that we're all going to get to the same place. As our the grand chief of my medicine society says, all creation stories are true. So there may be parts of your belief system that you don't have to change your religion, you don't have to turn your back on it, but you may need to spend some time coming to a place of peace because they may not always mesh with allyship. Your education. This is huge, particularly in Canada. We have not been taught the truth in Canada, at least not in the past. If you've been to public school in the past 20 or 30 years, we're making some progress now, thanks to the likes of people like Holly and Michael. But those of us who are older than 40 years old, we're simply not taught the truth. We cannot hold on to these old fashioned ideas like the, you know, like Samuel de Champlain was a hero. Well, how do you determine that? It's not good enough that your grade five teacher told you that. What do you classify as a hero and show me how he emulated those things? Because really, there's nothing heroic about Samuel de Champlain. So we need to challenge our education and we need to challenge our ignorance that even if we say, okay, there's stuff that I was taught that wasn't wrong and I can update that, then think of all the stuff you were never, ever taught, especially an Indigenous perspective never thought about an indigenous perspective to how we look at the land that we look at the land not as last month or last year but as thousands of generations my people walked on that same territory that is the place that my ancestors walked for thousands of years and that's how i see the land so it's not just about what you were mistaught it's about the stuff you've never had a chance to learn it's the stuff that you've never had an opportunity to enter into conversations. And I think I'm not a huge Brene Brown fan. I, I've only ever watched one of her shows, uh, but this conversation to me really sings about what allyship is about. Sings to be about why we do land acknowledgements because this is not an easy process, but change only happens through discomfort. If you're sitting completely comfortable in your chair, you don't move. But when your foot falls asleep, you shift or when your hip starts to hurt, you move. And so 
you need to be able to say, it's okay for me to be a little uncomfortable because that's how change is going to happen. And when you don't enter into this work because it makes you uncomfortable, as Brene Brown says, that's the definition of privilege. You don't have to be uncomfortable because everything's going well for you. Isn't that nice? Your comfort is no longer at the center of these discussions. Your comfort is certainly not a consideration in allyship because discomfort is what makes change. So I'm, I think I'm running out of time. I have a few minutes left and I wanted to talk with you before I get to the whole land acknowledgement part. I wanted to talk with you about the cultural safety continuum because it's important to me that we um, talk about these things, but we also have a path. Like in our conversations, we create paths that we can walk together moving forward. This cultural safety continuum was created by a Maori nurse whose name was Iriha Petty Ramsden um, back in the 80s, I believe. And she was working as a nurse in the um, health system in New Zealand. And she was really frustrated by the inequities in accessing healthcare for the Indigenous people, her people in that country. And so she created this path to how we can get to a place where everyone has the same opportunities for adequate, if not more than adequate healthcare, that people weren't being left behind. So this is her work that you see here. I, here, I would strongly advise you to go ahead and Google um, Ereha Petty Ramsden and look deeper into her work. She was an amazing woman, did amazing work. There are other people that have also done um, offshoots on the cultural safety continuum. I'm making that point because I want to give her complete credit for what you see. I'm about to add some language to unpack this. That language all comes from my perspective and I don't want you to blame her for that. So give her credit for what she's done, but don't blame her for what I'm about to add to it. So if we unpack this process, we see that it starts at colorblindness. And to me, colorblindness is basically the inability to see beyond your own experience. To me, it's wrapped up in I don't see color, right? If you don't see color, it means you're completely negating the fact that people of color have different experiences in our society today. I always tell the, the story of my husband buying corn on the cob. He watched four other people buy corn on the cob. And every time they got to the cashier, the cashier would say, how many cobs are in your bag? And they'd say six or 12 or 18. She would ring it up and off they go. But when my husband got to the counter, she didn't ask him. She took every cob of corn out of his bag, counted it, put it back in the bag, and then she rang it up on her till. And Austin said, why did you take the corn out of my bag and count it. You didn't count anybody else's corn. And she said, because some people try and steal a cob of corn. And the only way she had to dis determine that Austin was some people was by his physical appearance. She didn't know what car he drove up in, how much money he had in his pocket. She just knew that he was an Indian and Indians steal. When you say, I don't see color, you completely ignore the fact that Austin faces that day in and day out. It's okay for you to say, I don't judge by color, but it's not okay not to see it. Canadian society treats others as others, and we need to recognize that. We become culturally aware when we say, okay, I understand that people who look different than me, sound different than me, wear different thing, pieces of clothing, they get treated differently. I don't like it. I hope I'm not perpetuating it, but that's what our society is based on today. That's when you become aware. You become culturally sensitive when you say, those experiences that Austin, my husband, and other people are having because they are other, because they're Indian or Black or, or Asian, those experiences are going to color how they relate to me. They're going to drag those things into every relationship that they have. So just because I haven't treated Austin in any way that would make him not trust me, every other non-Indigenous person he's worked with that day has been untrustworthy. And how is he going to flick that switch? He's going to drag those interactions into our relationship. And I need to be patient with him until he works out that I'm not going to behave in the same way until I have demonstrated to him that he is safe in this environment. That's cultural sensitivity. It's understanding that though you may not be part of perpetuating these problems, we still drag them into our relationship with you. You get to be culturally competent when you actually acknowledge that and allow everybody to determine how they want to access services, how they want to create a relationship with you. That's when we become culturally competent. And I said that at the very beginning, when we are strong enough to say, this is how I like to do things, but I'm okay right now. So I'm just going to park that over here and I'm going to meet this person where they need to be met so that they can feel as safe as I do, so that they can feel as heard as I do. 
you we are all sacred we are all equally sacred but sometimes we need to park our sacredness over here and help fan somebody else's because society has been squishing them instead of holding them up we get to cultural safety when we create environments where everyone's experiences are equally valued and that then in turn leads to the last bullet point that i placed on eriha petty's uh, continuum, which is that's when we get to allyship, when we start to use our power and privilege to support groups who in our society right now don't have the same privileges. So this is a lovely um, intellectual exercise and lots of discussion can happen over this, but um, take a screenshot of this, guys, because I think this is more than just an intellectual exercise. This is a roadmap for you. This is a tool for you to be able to have those real honest conversations with yourself where are you on this continuum and have that honest conversation and then put it away and come back a couple of months from now and say now where am i today have i moved up that continuum am i really trying to get to a place where i'm creating cultural safety for everyone in our society or have i been too busy and that's okay the work isn't cut out for everyone there's no um I, you know there's no report card at the end of life at least not in my belief system so um it's okay if you don't do the work but you can't call yourself an ally if you're not doing the work so ask yourself where you are look at it every once in a while use it as a barometer um, for judging your progress and your path and understand that although it's been drawn as an arrow it's never going to be just a one-way path you're going to slip down you're going to you know come up again it's really a very complicated snakes and ladders game all wrapped up into that arrow um, that's so misleading because you will slip down um, in the workshop we do we actually unpack some of those ways that um, we are challenged because our perspective is challenged and we only have our own lens to look through when we stop and go wait a minute this isn't about me this is about someone else and we look through that lens then we're able to say oh okay i get it i can be culturally competent i can allow that person's perspective uh, to drive the bus it's okay if i don't hear that particular christmas song every year because it may be harmful to other people to hear it on the radio that's when we understand so we we need to be able to look at this we need to be able to be really honest with ourselves about um you know our ability to walk up that path to be really honest with ourselves about what things in society cause us to slide back down again and then be committed to keep moving forward I'm just checking my time here. So let's wrap this all up with land acknowledgements as an ally. So here is this allyship work and it's, you know, sort of a lifelong path. It's not something you arrive at. To me, allyship is the journey. And it, land acknowledgements can be a really meaningful step within that process. Really, as my first slide said, it can be the first step because it really is about truth first. And although in a land acknowledgement, you aren't specifically giving Indigenous people a voice, you do have the opportunity to give voice to this truth. You have an opportunity to say, you know what, when I was taught doctrine of discovery, terra nullius, that's not true. The land that I occupy today, wherever that is, my living here, my life here, the privilege I have here is based on thousands of years of stewardship by the original inhabitants of this land. We can no longer take that for granted. We cannot say, oh, the Indians survived here before Europeans showed up. We need to give voice to the truth. So you can do that. You're not appropriating my culture by telling the truth. You're just telling the truth, right? I think land acknowledgements become even more powerful when you place yourself in the story. So where did your history on this land start? And I've heard people say, I want to acknowledge that I live and work and play in the traditional territory of these nations. Um, I myself am descended from settlers who first lived in the traditional territory of the Wendat people or whoever. You are placing yourself in that story. You are saying, this isn't something that happens around me. This is something that requires my energy and my thought and my presence. You can also place yourself in the story by talking about why is it that you share land acknowledgements. Um, I in the, in the land acknowledgement workshop that I do, I I do talk a lot about sometimes being able to answer uh, the people are saying, "What are you doing that for?" is almost as important, if not more important, than the wording of your actual land acknowledgement. 
what are you doing a land acknowledgement for? This is my way that ensuring we never forget where we live or the truth of how we got here, right? One of the things I say in my workshop is two of the really necessary ingredients to me in a land acknowledgement is that acknowledgement that Indigenous people have been here for thousands of years and them keeping this land pristine and beautiful is what um, made those Europeans that first showed up here by accident want to keep coming over in greater and greater numbers and eventually staying and eventually colonizing. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the way that those lands and resources that we protected for thousands of years were taken from us in a completely inequitable way. And that was the basis of Canadian society today is based on the taking of those resources. I often use, do I have time for this analogy? I often use the analogy of uh, two young couples that are just starting out their lives together. One young couple comes from a very affluent family. So they get given their down payment on their first house and they start their life together, living in a home that, that they have purchased and are paying off a mortgage on. Other young couple doesn't come from an affluent family. They have to save and save and save their down payment in order to buy their first house. So take those two couples, Fast forward 25 years into the future, who do you think is going to be more secure financially? Pretty obviously, it's going to be the couple that started out with that down payment and started, you know, building equity in their home. Maybe they up level, upgraded to a bigger home. Maybe they cashed in that equity for other reasons to buy a boat, right? The other couple didn't have that choice. That's the story of Canada. Because during colonization, there was an equitable treatment uh, or equitable payment for the lands and resources. And in fact, many of it was just taken, which is what unseated means, that there was no agreement. Um, that's the family that got the down payment. They got to start farther ahead. Um, they didn't start from nothing. They started from something extra. So um, placing yourself in the story and being able to say, this is why I say it is because it's time that we told the truth is a really important part of this process. Think of a land acknowledgement to me as part of your identity. I think that's what can really make it real for people and can really resonate with people. You're quite used to standing up well, we sit down a lot now at, on Zoom and other virtual meeting platforms, but we enter into um, new relationships by saying, hi, my name's Kelly. Um, I am the, you know, I'm an independent consultant working at this. I live here. We, we're quite used to introducing ourselves. We have a real handle on parts of our identity that we share in certain locations and parts that we don't. Sometimes we walk into a group where everyone knows us and we say, hey, Kelly's here. Other times we walk in to a brand new situation or a situation outside of our normal circle where we have to give more information. This is what I do for a living. This is why I'm coming here. So think of a land acknowledgement as part of your identity. Where you live, where you work, where you play is as much a part of your identity as what you do for a living or um, you know, why you're entering into these spaces. And that might make you feel more comfortable in why it is that we do this sharing. So where you work, whose territory you're on, what treaties cover that territory is just as much a part of your um, identity to me as your title is. And so think about that. Think about making that real to you as you place yourself in the story. What is it that you want people to know about the place that you live and that you work and that you play? That is how we tie to me um, land acknowledgements and allyship up in that tiny, tidy, sorry, not tiny. It's a big package, but it's a tidy little package. And it gets us moving up that safety continuum. It gets us moving on the path to reconciliation, which is where we want to go. So with that, I will say chimi guach, weilaliok, thank you so much. I hope uh, that some of you may have some questions for me and that was a useful uh, was I 45 minutes or did I go over, Holly? No, you're fine, Kelly. And we normally go till 8.30 by the time we do some talking and the questions and all that stuff. So you don't have to rush. It's wonderful. It was really great. Um, and I did notice there was a couple comments in the chat and some hands that were up. So let's offer an opportunity. Um, we can go to the... Uh, I, so I, if, if anyone has questions, feel welcome to put them in the chat. If you want to just turn your mic on and ask and speak to Kelly, please go ahead and do that as well. We're a small um, virtual group this way tonight, so please feel welcome to do that. 
those of you who have been in workshops with me before know I, I outright bully participants to ask me questions. <laughs> I love to have conversations about stuff. And thank you, Sarah, for your comment in the chat box. I'll break the silence. I just want to say that that was amazing and really, I have a dog in my face, really refreshing to hear. Um, I've been craving those discussions and you like super packed that in. So that was like every word you said was with intention and I really appreciate that. And yes, I've had your workshops before um, and really thoroughly enjoyed them, but that was really great. Thank you. Nyawa. My pleasure, Nyawa. Anne? Ani, I just wanted to add one little thing. Um, you you talked about um, now. Let me get this straight. My poor head here. Um, you talked about coming together and and what it means to be an ally and giving that space, that safe space. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add was that um, you know, there's lots of time to tell your story when you're an ally. And one of the things that you need to do as an ally is listen to our story. And yes, that you might be able to relate to it. And you might be able to relate to similar circumstances in your own life. But at this moment in time, it's really important that we get to tell our story and you get to listen without interruption, without relating it back to yourself, because that can be done at another time at a further discussion. But it's very, very important that we get to tell our story and that our story gets heard and not only heard, but listened to. Listened to. Um, and I think your your presentation was was just beautiful, Kelly. And I thank you so much. Miigwech. How chimiguetch. And I could not agree with you more that, you know, the path to allyship and, and, and the path to, you know, understanding that concept of time immemorial, understanding all of these processes is about being able to listen. Um, not to, in, I, I said that I want you to insert yourself in your land acknowledgement because I want you to make that a real thing, not just I'm head nodding to history or something, but to put yourself in that story. But you're right, allyship is not about you. It's absolutely not about you. So it's time to listen and to truly hear. Miigwech for that, Anne. Anybody else, please? I have a bit of a question brewing, Kelly, that I, and, and maybe it's just asking for your opinion, but, you know, there are times when, like you mentioned, you know, was it drunken Uncle Fred or, you know, like the, the, when you encounter people, um, for me, I think of how my learning journey has taken place. And sometimes when I'm chatting with people you know, that might be in different walks of life that might not have the opportunity to be in education and, and participating in these types of things. And I think, you know, I, I kind of recognize where you're at um, and encountering people in a way that, that encourages them to continue learning is different sometimes than calling them out. You know, some, sometimes we hear a lot about um, speaking truth to power or, and, and these are all important ways of, of standing up. But then sometime, sometimes I'm wondering about language for bringing people in rather than putting them in their place. And I just was curious if you had experience or, um, or any opinion to offer around that. Oh, Michael, absolutely. And I, I was chuckling because I was looking at your face going, Michael has a question. I'm just wondering if he's going to answer it, ask it to me, because I could see it all over your face. Um, but that's a brilliant question. And I get asked it in a simpler version very, very often. I, I get asked, quite frankly, what do I do when someone says something racist? What do I do when someone says something that's just ignorant? What do I do? 
And my response is very much what you've just talked about, not tearing down, but building up. And so what I suggest your first step is, so if somebody said to me, oh, you know, Indians get everything paid for. I don't know what they're bitching about. They get everything paid for. What I would say is, really, that's not been my experience. Where did you learn that? And when you ask somebody who's, you know, holding something that you believe to be untrue or false or, or inaccurate, and you say to them, where did, you, where did you find that out? Who told you that? Where did you learn that? They then have to self-examine right? And they need to look at it, not in a way that's challenged, but to say, you know, let's have a look at that. And is that accurate information? And can we build on that? So instead of saying, no, you're wrong, say, wow, where did you learn that? Because I know something different. Be really happy to talk with you about, about where you learned that. And that's always been my, does that help at all, Michael? To me, that's been, uh, you know, a really good way of starting these conversations. More than a confrontational one. Is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely it is. And uh, I think more and more um, these, it, like I'm almost, as you're speaking, I'm almost thinking of the that space between appropriation and appreciation too is somehow very similar where you, you, you have to engage in some self-reflection there if it, in both those areas of, of uh, is this a appropriation or appreciation and um, Anyway, I'm kind of babbling now, but I did find it very helpful. Thanks. Miigwech. And, and I think the appropriation question is, is very valid, particularly when we're talking about people in education. And I think I've had this conversation uh, with Holly and probably Wendy in the room before. Should I do my uh, five-second Chicken McNugget on appropriation, Holly? So bear with me until the end, because those of you who are teachers on the call may go, but, but wait till I get to the end. So to me... Um, it, it's a very clear line and it's not something that's fuzzy. It's not something that's hard to understand. Participation, or as you said, appreciation is not appropriation. Buy beaded earrings and wear them. Hang native art in your home. Smudge your house. Participating is not appropriation. It crosses a very broad, very clearly defined line and becomes appropriation when one of two things happens. Remember, hold on till I get till the end. The first one is if you become the teacher. So if someone walks in when you're smudging your house and they say, what are you doing? And you start saying, well, the Anishinaabe people used to gather uh, sage and they would burn it and the smoke would clear the bad spirits out of their house. That's appropriating my culture. I don't care who taught that to you. I don't care where you got that information. If you don't come from that culture, if you don't live in that way of knowing you are appropriating somebody else's culture. It's why I never say something like, oh, what a Zen moment. Because that's not my culture. And I would, I, I, how am I to know whether what's Zen or what isn't Zen? That's not, doesn't come from me. I would be appropriating someone else's culture if I said that. The second scenario it becomes appropriation is if you should um, get any sort of gain from it. So if you start making dream catchers and selling them at the farmer's market, you are appropriating my culture. Now, let's circle back to the teaching thing because I'm talking to teachers and we don't have enough Indigenous people in classrooms that are able to tell these things to students. We need teachers to be a vehicle for starting to tell the truth about Canadian history, to start tell the truth about Canadian Indigenous relations today. We need you to be there. We need you to be doing it. What I ask teachers to do is to not say, here is the fact, but to say, this is what I've learned so far. This is what I've been taught. And then people like you and Holly can arrange to have other experts come in um, and, and can actually give firsthand knowledge to the students. But we're never going to be there all the time. And so we need teachers to do that. But it's a, it's maybe subtle to you. But to me, it's a really important difference when you're talking to somebody about Indigenous issues that you say, this is what I've been taught so far. Not I am the holder of this knowledge, not I am the owner of this knowledge, but just this is where I've got so far. Does that make sense, Michael? Yes, very much so. Thanks. Anne. Yeah, I just want to, and um, again, um, wonderful, uh, wonderful words. Um, I just wanted to give a slight warning. Um, I just want to warn people that you're not always going to, your help is not always going to be welcome. Your allyship is not always going to be welcome. 
you're going to run into people who who are not ready to accept that who still hold on to a lot of anger and who still um, hold on to a lot of issues personal issues um, that make it difficult for them to accept your friendship your allyship to accept that someone actually is on our side it, it's difficult for a lot of people and um, a lot of you will will come away with bruised and hurt feelings um, but don't let that stop you just because one person is not ready to accept your uh, friendship or your your outstretched hand doesn't mean that we're all like that um, we are all walking a path and we're all at different points on that path and some of us have reached a point where we where we can take that hand and walk beside you but there are still many of us that hold on to too much pain and too much hurt to be able to do that right now and so um, I just don't want you to give up if you encounter someone who is not ready to accept that extended hand of friendship. Please don't let that stop you. Um, because uh, it's important that that you build a thick skin because we have had to do that for the past almost 500 years now. We've had to we've had to thicken our skin against so much. And I promise you the the hurt that you will feel is is minuscule to what our people have gone through. But that doesn't mean it's less important. But it just means that that you have to have that understanding that um, not everybody is there yet. And um, I hope that you keep trying because I know that it can be scary. It can be really frightening to um, try and become involved in First Nation Inuit Métis issues, communities. Um, it can be scary. It can be daunting. Um, but you have to build up your courage. And, um, you know, if you feel it in your heart, then your heart will lead you. And I promise that there are people out there who are willing to take that hand of friendship. You just have to search it out. But uh, just be aware that that you will probably at some point encounter harsh feelings and it's going to hurt. But take that hurt and turn it around and, uh, and um, try and see where that hurt is coming from before you make any decisions about people. Um, I just wanted to warn you of that because I know I, I have, um, I have hurt people with things that I have said. And um, I just, I just don't want you to go away thinking that um, this is an easy road because it certainly isn't. It certainly isn't. If it was easy, it would have been done years ago. And we have, you know, we've been on this road for a long time now, but we have so many generations to go still. Um, and I, I, I want to thank you for being a part of this, each and every one of you, because it means that progress is, is happening. And I think of, of my friend here, Mike, um, it's just a joy. It's been an absolute joy watching Mike's journey um, because the knowledge that he has gained and watching his um, the paradigm shift in his thinking is absolutely amazing. It's, it's just wonderful to watch. Um, and and I, hope, um, I hope for each and every one of you that that paradigm shift occurs and you get to see things in a new light, in a new way with that two-eyed seeing. Um, so miigwech. Miigwech, Shan, and I certainly uh, agree that people need to be prepared uh, for uh, genuine reactions from Indigenous people when they enter into uh, relationships with them. I would have put that conversation under safety um, and trust, not allyship. If you're still in a position to be hurt by how someone responds to you, then I would suggest you're nowhere near ready to look at allyship because allyship is being able to be strong enough to say, I'm okay, what do they need from me? 
Um, and so I agree that when we start this past, we don't start at allyship. Allyship's farther down that continuum, but we start being able to place, um, tr to be able to create places of safety and trust with Indigenous people. If we don't trust you, it's not necessarily your fault. And, you know, thank you, Anne, for pointing out all those ways uh, that Indigenous people drag their history into new relationships with them. And if you get hurt by that, you're going to burn out in an hour and a half. So, Chimi Gwedge for sharing that. But when we think about allyship, we've done that work. We've been through those places and we are strong enough to say, I'm okay. I'm okay if um, I don't get the reaction I want. I'm okay if I don't feel comfortable in the situation because it's no longer about me. That's the key to allyship. It's about somebody else. Uh, uh, Kristen, thank you for the comments that you um, have made. Uh, in the chat box, I'm glad that you appreciated the continuum. And I'm glad that you let me off the hook for Gord Downing. Miigwech for that. Anyone else? Sheila, I can see your hand in your camera. I still can't hear you, my friend. No, there's there's no sound at all. It's like your microphone is right off. It's not a, a volume thing. I wonder if it's because of your headphones. We have to unplug them. Let's try that. Okay, I unplugged the headphones. Um, I just wanted to say, I worked up north for a number of years, and one of the um, one of the startling lessons that I had to learn early on was when people would come to the door and say, "Can I visit?" And then they would come in and sit in silence. And at first I, I was so uncomfortable with it. I thought like, you know, mm -hmm. are we supposed to be talking about something? I, am I supposed to ask you something? But I learned quickly that no, it was all right. And after they had sat for a while, they'd say, okay, and off they'd go again. Thank you for the visit. What a brilliant, a brilliant example. example. That's just an amazing example, Sheila, that, it, you know, you have a process, you have a way that visits happen, but it wasn't about you because you were in their community. I couldn't have thought of a better example than that. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing Thank that you. this evening. Thank you. But I, in fact, I'm probably going to steal that and use it. I'm doing a whole full day allyship workshop tomorrow. You just may get some credit in there at some point. Yeah. Well, friends, if there is no one else who has anything for Kelly this evening, I just wanted to say a huge chimiguetch for finishing up our speaker series, Kelly, um, and to Anne for being here as well to support and open with a prayer for us. We um, have been so, so fortunate, Michael and I, to be guided by so many who are uh, helping us to be learners and to work as hard as we possibly can to create these spaces so that we can hear from voices like yours. Uh, and Michael and I want to continue the conversation. And so you um, have received emails from us over the course of this series to remind you to check out the web page where we're um, hosting information about the speakers. And we would like to task you with a little bit of homework until we see you again in the fall, until there's more announced, because part of this for he and I has really been about um, offering you an opportunity to sit and listen and be learners uh, to create your own acknowledgements. And what we would love is if uh, some of you out there in our listening audience would be so brave as to share yours and offer us an opportunity to post it anonymously as examples on our site. Um, we, Michael and I, have had so many conversations around how uh, we both feel like the acknowledgements are um, a locator on our own learning journeys. 
and that as we learn more and we have the opportunities to sit and and listen and be with folks and learn that our acknowledgements change and grow as well and so we want to encourage you to see that in the same way um, and if you would be willing to share them with us we'll celebrate the, the learning that you have done and the work that you have done and post some of them and continue to come back and revisit and have these conversations again as we continue so um, you can you can um, email those to either Michael or myself and we will follow up uh, shortly in the next day or so with a, a giant thank you message to everyone who's been able to come and join us for the series and uh, with some um, opportunity for some feedback about other uh, topics that you might want to learn about for next year so we can continue on this journey together. And just on behalf of he and I, we're so grateful to all of um, the folks who came and shared their learning with us and held us up to continue to do this work in a good way, and especially to all those who came to be here to listen and to learn alongside of us. A huge giant miigwech, miau agoa. To everyone for being here this evening. Take care. Bama P. Bama P. Polly, before you sign off, Siegwin wants you to know she passed her exam. <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> well done. You're an official voter now. She is official voter. <laughs>